Hello and welcome back to another episode of Arts Talk. Today I am joined by special guest Phil Walker. Phil is an experienced IT technician and creator who is here to help explain our topic of the day, which is technology and the dealership. We will discuss how dealerships have evolved through technology with service bills being typed in a template, parts being searched using old bin cards and paper manuals, to AS400 green screens, to now GUI, drag and drop web browser interface, etc. It's a good one. Also, remember to hit the like button, download and share this podcast. You will find the full video of this episode on my YouTube channel, Parts Manager Professional. If you would like to make a donation to hear more interviews like this one, you can do so by using the information in the description box. Let's begin. Welcome to Parts Talk. Um, I brought you here because I wanted someone who has a intimate knowledge of IT because the topic I want to speak to, to someone of your experience today is the dealership and technology, technology and the dealership, right? And why I brought this up is because I had a, a little experience uh, just a couple of days, right? And one of the interesting thing is that when I started out in the automotive industry back in 1995, seems like a very long time ago, but <laughs> right? What we, what we had back then were paper manuals. And we actually move from paper manuals all the way up to what we're using now. Now you, now you can stay in the comfort of your own home by VPN and log on into your systems and check part numbers and all of this, right? So that is how far advanced the technology was, um, has advanced so for, for us, right? But at the same time, why I brought this up is, the, um, is because I, I, I had an experience just the other day. I walked into a dealership and... I wanted oil and filter for my car. I have a, I'm driving a 2019 Chevrolet Cruze. And when I went to the, the parts counter, I told the gentleman I wanted oil and filter. And he said, okay. He went into his system. He looked it up. Then he turned and looked at me and says, he's getting two, two different part numbers. He'd like to have my VIN number. Mm-hmm. At that point in time, no, I was very curious because... The little knowledge that I have, and I looked at him and I said, but that car only comes with two engines. It's either a 1.6 gas or a 1.6 diesel. I have the diesel. He yeah. says, he's not so sure. I said, okay. Um, I was a little bit peeved, but yeah. I understood, you know, having a little experience in the, in the industry, I understood. I went and got it, came back, and lo and behold, he brought it up. Mm-hmm. But back to the paper manual argument. I remember when we had the paper manual, a book, with mm-hmm. that gives you the model information, the part numbers, everything, right? Mm-hmm. And one book would actually serve like four or five par- parts, guys. Right, right, wrote. and <laughs> and you know you had to sit and wait on the, until one person finished with the book before it yeah. it was handed over to somebody else, right? I, I, I bet you the IT guy thought that that was a selling point for putting the manual inside of the software, which is why the book exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, and. You, you had to look for the part numbers first and then go to, you know, the big squares, gray screen, which right. was, which was the call, what it was, the AS400 at the time. It was a green screen. And uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's totally ancient now. You only see those things in movies, right? <laughs> and the only thing you got from it was like 10 different prompts. And then you had different sections to go in it. When you mm-hmm. actually searching for a part, it only gave you the part number, the price, and the location that's it then yep. you go and you print your invoice and the works now compared to where we where we were then to where we are now personally i think we have gotten lazy <laughs> right so i want to you know knowing your expertise based on based on where we were back then and to give a synopsis of um how where do we actually go wrong is it that we're better now or we have gotten somewhat too much of too dependent on it on the, on the technology um so that that's an interesting question um and it's very very loaded because of um how the systems have evolved and what the systems are capable of doing now um what tends to happen with a lot of the workflows as um as the systems become quote unquote more intelligent or incorporate more elements to it um, the the workflows themselves kind of adapt and evolve and the, the talent that they need to hire 
to utilize the systems will change over a period of time. So um, just to go back to the story, um, you probably, you, you, you started at a point where it pivoted away from um, manual processes to the inception of using compute power on these resources. Um, and for the, the IT department and for um, the, the strategic business interests at the time, they probably thought it would have been um, brilliant getting this all in there. Um, and so when, when they initially started using, um, you know, the, the systems that they currently have right now, what is that? Right, the systems that they currently have right now, um, the idea was to put all of that inventory material into a system that would allow four keystrokes and get you back information. Right? Yeah. The guy before that would have had to leave through the inventory, um, you know, document or, or, or folder and, yeah. and, and be able to correlate um, bin information to figure whether or not the item was there and whether or not the item had sufficient quantities to fulfill the order. Yeah, definitely. So, because we had, we were, we had to use a, a bin card system <laughs> to manually record the, the part number, the location, and the, and the quantity. And each time an item was sold, you'd have to mark off that, that quantity and exactly. put a new one, right? Yeah, exactly. So proper inventory had to be checked on a daily basis in order to know exactly what, what, was, on, what was on hand. Right. So um, if, you, if you even look at um, you know, supermarkets and stuff like that back in the day, um, they had similar problems. So it, to reconcile inventory for them, could only be like a quarterly or a half yearly occurrence. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing in the, 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 you know, the automotive industry. Um, a, a close enough reflection of inventory really required you to not only consistently reconcile information, but be able to consistently deduct information at the point of sale. Yes. So that you could, you could reconcile those numbers. Yeah. Now you move from that AS400 system um, to something that um, probably had a little bit more intelligence at the terminal end. Um, and what you find happening is um, they started baking a lot more information into some kind of tying hash. And, and what that tying number was going to be was it was going to be something like a VIN number. Yeah. Right? So once you start using like the VIN number as like the core of doing anything in the system, um, you, you find that the workflows are kind of hinged around VIN. And the more people you onboard, the more they kind of view everything as central to that single point that the system depends on. And they can't function if the, if the system doesn't give them back that information. Yeah. You, know, you, you fast forward to where we are at now, and they've, they've embedded so much information on the systems and hinged that information on VIN numbers that what, what to us might seem like ignorance is really somebody who is incapable of processing without the information that the system requires. So if they don't have the VIN, they, they can't function. Nothing can't. In the system yeah, is. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because I remember when... When I was when I, when I when I just started out and I had mentors at that time, and they would give me the manual and say, "Young man, in order for you to move forward, you need to know this book." And it had four go sections go in go it. Go. Yeah, it had four <laughs> sections. It had the engine, the chassis, the body, then electrical. Yeah. It was the early two thousand that they started adding um, that they added accessories to it as a fifth mm -hmm. element, mm -hmm. right? But we had to depend on memory and innovation of the mind to but it actually it actually helped us because when somebody walked in and said they have a 1995 corolla they need this part blah 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 you automatically know you knew the part number right. mm -hmm. you knew the part number you didn't have to depend on to go into the system to check to see exactly which one it was you knew offhand so right. we were much faster given the the resources we had at the time yeah. Um, so there, there is a pro and a con to that. Um, yeah. The pro of the, the older systems is that the end users 
from the system perspective, that would be, you know, the, the person who's punching in the information, they had to have certain, you know, knowledge to really manipulate the system to accomplish the goal, mm -hmm. right? Um, what they've been trying to do over a period of time, and it's not just the automotive industry, it's a number of different industries. They have been trying to make the process very, you know, like easy. Like you don't have to accumulate a ton of information in order to go in front of the system and work with the system. And they wanted the, the, the singular platform to be able to do so many different things. So yeah. when you probably started out, um, the, the system had probably about five options in the menu. <laughs> yeah right? yeah it had less than 10 options i i i, I remember right. that distinctly yeah right so but you look at something like 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 you know dealer center that's there now or 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 um, or something like cams and the mini system is like exhaustive it's like 50 odd stuff in yeah. the menu mm -hmm. um and practically all of those workflows all of those little mini options they all have a little you know, thing that you need to click or a, a number that you have to remember and the sequences are completely different than before. And there is no, <laughs> for every single menu option, the manual override is, a, is a, in itself an involved process. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen with the, the end user who's in front of it is that instead of, retaining actionable information relating to products and services. They yeah. know spending a bunch of time just trying to remember how to get around a single problem that occurs on a single screen. Yeah. yeah, they try to, you know, assist the, the end user as much as possible because everything is all about um, time management, as you know, uh, getting the right information and the product to the customer, right? But at the same time, no, you have to try to make the process as seamless as possible. I also think that some of those systems, the way that they're built, um, they're not necessarily built to ensure that the, the, the customer, as we know them, gets the best experience. It's really there to provide um, strategic information for, mm. for, for the organization to pivot around. Right. So, so you find increasingly that these graphs about, you know, um, you know, the, the, the churn rate on a particular part is more important than making usable screens that, that the end user yeah, can calculate. Yeah, that is true. Because <laughs> as you, when you mentioned screens, I can remember that the, the AS400, every single monitor had to have this large anti-glare screen on top of it, right? <laughs> so, you know, sitting there looking at it, 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 was, it was bad for the eyes. Yeah. And I remember also that almost 90% of the part staff at that time they all wore glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, per, yeah, persons who work in the parts department, they tend to stay there a very long time. And over years, the eyes went bad staring at those screens for a, for a, for a, for a, for a consistent amount of time. Yeah. And I, I think when you look at how the industry has evolved, um, increasingly what you're finding um, now is that the systems are doing stuff way that, uh, above and beyond what the the point of integration is. So usually it'd be just like, all right, I need to get information from a customer um, and correlate that information to um, parts or, or services that I'm procuring. Mm -hmm. um, the systems now are doing sales processing, they're doing form printing, they're doing you know, historical analysis, they're doing credit reporting, they're doing payments. Yeah. Um, and, and so you're having one system that is trying to fulfill this, these, you know, multitude of functions. Mm -hmm. And the end user has to be cognizant of which particular functions yeah. are just for them. Um, what would have been nice. And I think that's going to happen in the, like the next iteration of mm -hmm. um, the software that supports the business is that um, it's going to become a lot more user friendly on the user side. And they might extend that user experience outside of the organization and give 
like you walking into the store, you're getting a mobile screen to to check the information. Yeah, and, yeah, and just like what might, just like what is happening at the airports, you you check yourself in. Yeah, right, right, and you might end up having to deal with the same VIN information. <laughs> the system will not process it out of VIN information. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In which way, so we we it, it's I think they are actually um, it's it's a win and a loss in some respects, like you said before, where um, some of the, the the things that are related to the industry, they're at the core of the industry, an understanding of the components, and an understanding how you know the the vehicles function, and an understanding about you know, what is required in order to do X, Y, or Z is going to be a little bit um, difficult um, to translate into the current paradigm because an, oversimplif- uh, an oversimplification is what's happening. So yeah. <laughs> you, you no longer have those rigors to deal with. You are just trying your, your utmost best to just cope with what you have here. Yeah, yeah. All right, Fillmore, what, what I wanted to do was to, you know, take you through the journey from w- when I started in 1995 till now, mm-hmm. right? Because we know exactly what the system can do now. Right. But what I experienced in terms of the, the evolution of the system, right, from a parts perspective, because that was, that, was that was my pet peeve right there. And my, the, most of my knowledge came from the parts department. And what I saw was from, we moved from the AS400 system, which we were using a system called Dealerman. Okay. Right. And at the same time, now new reporting standards came, came on us. And mm-hmm. Dealerman at the time was unable to give us a lot of the information that was required, which was Excel based programs, how to calculate formulas, how to okay. interface. Um, a lot of the reports over into mm-hmm. into reporting okay. standards for PDF file and, and, and everything. However, when we got ADP, I think ADP is now CDK Global. When we moved over into that system, it was still inadequate based on what we wanted. Because back in 2010, we wanted to use an inventory management system called the ABC analysis. Mm-hmm. Right? And in Japan, they call it the ICC, which was inventory control conversion. And we couldn't get ADP to, to, do, that sort of to do that sort of stuff. So we had to build, you know, so, yeah, we, yeah, we had to get uh, the, the IT person at the time had to do standalone, um, mm-hmm. standalone hard drives, mm-hmm. program into the system. Yeah. And the program into the system and then try to, you know, link from one aspect to the other. I yeah. think at the time, ADP, ADP technicians were so impressed that we were able to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. Right? A lot of the things that were that that are that were inside ADP now were actually realized from us yeah. here in the Caribbean, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um it, it, it's interesting that you should mention that because some of the, the segue um discussions that happen between Um, organizations that are based on that old platform and how it um, kind of necessitates a a move forward is based on those integration issues. Yeah. So um, like the AS400 before, it was really just a repository. Um, What they were hoping when they moved to the Wintel platforms in the the 2000s was that um, the the compute power that was at the stations because now they're using PCs at the stations. Right? Yes, yes. As opposed to using dumb terminals that they had before. Yeah. They were hoping that the compute power at the stations would allow them to get greater, you know, information manipulation capabilities. And so you find that they built software like ADP and Fraser. They were built on this, this concept of what they call a thick client where the client itself has a lot of functionality built into it or baked into it. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with a thick client, though, is that it's not very adaptable. So if it needs to do something custom, yeah. somebody has to rewrite that client in order for it to do that kind of custom feature. Mm-hmm. Now, 
you run into that problem often enough and you you you, you start searching for ways of finding a solution exactly and, yeah and what's happening with the next tier of software now is that they're migrating to um sort of like a web 2.0 platform it has to be web centric web yes based. yes definitely and yeah the behind it being web centric or web based is that if you need to do modifications on the platform, you can do it at source and it just populates on all the clients and it's not a heavy installation process to get it done. Um, what, what, what we are also seeing is that when you have to build in new features, what the, the IT guys call APIs, right? Um, or in interfaces into other systems, um, application program interfaces. It, it becomes a lot easier on a, on a web-based platform because we can just write in new, new stuff. So what you're finding on a new system is a bunch of interfaces into stuff like cookbooks and yeah. you know, um, some of the, the existing um, statutory bodies that need that kind of interaction. You know, like you'll, you'll put in a, update for a car and it will automatically push that information over to um, like the, 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 the DMVs in the case of um, the, the American institutions mm -hmm. where it will actually um, reconcile information with um, you know the provincial authorities relating to the car. Yeah. Um, so you want to expand on that as much as possible so what, what the new platforms are trying to do is focus on integration as you said before yeah and i i kind of like where we are now because the the technology is moving very very fast no you can yeah no you know you have standalone systems that come from the manufacturer themselves especially here in the united states that you can put the vin number in mm -hmm. and you get a complete history of the car itself the owner mm -hmm. the service history <laughs> everything recommended the recommended um timeline for maintenance is every everything is, is actually there that's what's going to make you lazy. <laughs> it will exactly. It it has made us it has made us tremendously lazy, right? Um, it, it, it's interesting because um, when you look at the old AS four hundred systems and how they kind of did their processing um, back in the day, it's almost like we're gone back right to that because processing in the AS four hundred was on the AS four hundred server. Okay. Right? Then eventually, you know, you did some of the processing. Um, on the client side with um, the, the ADP type systems. Yeah. Right? I know we have gone back with, um, with these web-based products to actually doing processing back on the server again. Um, the, the, the future might actually look a little bit different because what's happening um, with us now is the, the DMARC point for the system interaction before was mm -hmm. was the guy at the desk talking to the customer yeah the next round of systems are going to extend that out to the customer themselves so you're actually finding in a lot of these scenarios um you look at like a, a, a tesla right now and the, the car will talk to the manufacturer and the manufacturer will relay that information to the dealers when the car comes in for service Mm -hmm. So the, the extensibility of the, the, the management platforms are no longer just a matter of, you know, dealer management systems as they were once thought of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Complete customer relationship management platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that focus is now becoming um, a little bit more, you know, targeted. So before on the AS400 systems, it was all about parts inventory um, and service. Mm -hmm. And now it, what is even more important is, you know, marketing, sales, etc. I've seen it. It's, it's all about marketing now more than anything else. Yeah. So they'll, they'll tell you stuff like, um, yeah, the, the platform will automatically push information over to Facebook, Twitter, um, and, you know, LinkedIn, those kind of social channels because it's part of their marketing funnel. Yeah. Um, if, if, if it's even doing, you know, fiduciary checks of customers, it's, it's, it's correlating information from the banks and in the same breath, negotiating things like, you know, 
rates and 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 pitching that rate to the customer as you mm-hmm. for X Y Z. And then people talk about privacy policy and all these things. <laughs> 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 so there's absolutely none. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's it's to a lot of people right now. Um, it seems very disconnected. Um, when they walk in, they figure that you know whatever they put in the system, mm-hmm. um, it's it's kind of relegated to just that system. But the systems right now are becoming increasingly integrated. Yeah, um, and so <laughs> there are some people when they're look when they're looking at the the usage reports mm-hmm. that that the system generates are like how did you pull all of that information yeah and, you know the, the, those platforms are capable of doing a whole lot more than what those reports actually generate yeah yeah i've seen it i've seen it sometimes all they need all they need from you is like confirmation that is all yeah. Yeah, because yeah. they already have all the information there right there sitting up yeah at their fingertips right but i want to you know take take um, my listeners on a journey a little that mm-hmm. especially in the service department what we had at one point was a dispatcher right a dispatcher when the vehicle comes in for servicing the dispatcher would look at it um based on the qualification of a particular technician then he or she would assign that vehicle to the technician right mm-hmm. based on their skill set now with the current systems the dispatcher is the the, 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 the the dispatcher is no more. That <laughs> position no longer exists. Just like a secretary who used to type up the orders and fax it off, and those positions are gone. gone yeah. Right now, when a technician sign um goes to work in the morning and he signs in, automatically he can see exactly what the, um, yeah what is available, what is there, because based on his skill set. Then he can he he now can pick and choose pick and choose whichever vehicle he wants to work on, right? So something like that now is you know how 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 can you explain like the integration of that system to where it was removing the dispatcher? So it, it's like what we said before. Um, you're trying to roll in additional features, additional functions as the the system evolves. Um, and what you're going to see increasingly is um, these are the types of automation that when people mention automation, um, this is what, what happens. Uh, you look at Fraser, for example, back in the 2000s, and mm-hmm. what they considered revolutionary at the time was being able to roll up like 25 different forms into the system that can yeah. automatically be populated with information relating to the, 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 the data on the service order. Mm-hmm. What that basically means is you don't need a secretary to go type up 25 <laughs> different versions of uh, yeah. a, a letter relating to that. I remember um, back in Ace 400 days, um, it was the same time that I had stuff like just that now machine <laughs> and they'd, they'd roll um, like 50 copies of um, a compliance you know, letter that you had to you know, sign and then stick on the customer's file to say, um, you know, we're in- indemnifying the organization from X. Mm-hmm. Those are automatically generated in the system in the early 2000s. You look at where we are at now, and it, it's, it's a whole lot more extensive. Yeah. Um, you're looking at um, customizations that are not just inserting you know, regular fields, you have a person coming to sit in front of you to negotiate, for example, the purchase of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And because the system is able to check credit rating actively, it can negotiate with the financial institution a custom rate for you, incorporate that into the documents relating to the bill of sale. And at the end of the day, print it out. And that's just one person generating all of that. Mm -hmm. Usually... (laughs) Back in the day, there'd be a bean counter involved trying to call into some bank resource to try and correlate that information. The yeah. timeline for you know finalizing sales are mm-hmm. no longer measured in days or weeks. They're yeah. almost instantaneous. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same thing on, on something like the parts flow, where you're trying to correlate information that would normally, um, in a manual system, take you 
you know, like 15 to 20 minutes, the system is going to make some assumptions almost immediately as soon as you put in um, information into the system. Right. So um, they, <laughs> I've actually seen instances where the end user in front of the system probably knows better than the system what the rules and the the the, the formulae already embedded in the system will not allow them to do x <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, you, you look at something like um all right you might not be able to use this particular oil type but this other one will suffice will suffice yeah will not allow him to sell that oil type against that vin mm -hmm. because it's not in the pre assigned you know yeah rule set. yeah only an experienced person will know exactly what what else can be used yeah Right, and um, for, for the most part, when you, when you are you know, fast forwarding um, on the timeline to try and figure out the impact on um, organizations and, and, and individuals who are hired to these organizations, um, it's, it's, in some instances, it can be troubling because what they're asking is for less rigorous skill sets for that initial point of contact because mm. all of the stuff the system is willing to do or yeah. is capable. Yeah, you're, you're right. And that is one of the reasons why the, the industry itself right now is suffering from getting good people, people who have the experience and the know-how of moving around a dealership setting itself because they know that the system is preset now all they have to do is just give the the new prospect the just the yeah, basics, yeah. Right. <laughs> right? Just yeah. the basics to work with and to work with, and then throw them out into the deepest end of the ocean and tell them to swim. Yeah, it's 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 hilarious that you should mention that because um, I remember the onboarding experience um, in the early days required extensive apprenticeship. Yeah, <laughs> right? so exactly. You know, yeah work with somebody and they'd walk you through the ropes and um, all of that stuff. Onboarding onto the new systems now for the most part is going through a couple of YouTube videos and um, becoming acclimatized with the different menus. Um, yeah. And they're, they're hopeful that you'll be able to manage that at your own pace. Now, what that really means um, for a lot of people, people learn at different rates. Yeah. Back in the day, you could be stuck in apprenticeship for six to 10 months because you just, that's how long it would take you to assimilate all that information, mm -hmm. right? When somebody gives you a system <laughs> that has, you know, three hours of YouTube videos, they expect yeah. you to be conversant with the system. After. With the system, ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so um, and it, it, it shifts the um, the expectation, you know, dramatically in 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 ways that I don't think people understand um, from a dollars and cents perspective how it 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 translates to the employer no longer has to spend six months of salary on an individual, yeah. but the individual is under significant duress to onboard four hours worth of information as permanent information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I think it, it seems like it's getting easier, but it also adds a lot of stress. On, yeah. On your so. Yeah. One of the things that I was impressed with when I came and saw the system here, um, working at a dealership here in Toronto, was the, the ability to integrate so many, so many different dealerships right across the entire country itself yeah. so someone was able to look up a part if we do, don't have it in stock then you know that john brown's um auto which That's is true. like five kilometers down the road had that part in stock yep. and you could yep. call them and find out if they still have it and then you, know, you send the customer along there right yeah. in a very competitive environment now elsewhere you don't have things like those mm -hmm. right so it also depends on the region the country or you know the type of platform and the type of competition that is there yeah it i think it's inevitable though um 
as you move towards web-centric systems, yeah. the selling point behind web-centric systems is integration. Mm-hmm. Uh, how that integration happens and how that scaling happens, um, it's, it's no longer in the dealer's hand how the integration on the back end happens. You, you, yeah. you purchase a piece of software. The guy who makes the software is the guy who is busy doing the integration. So I worked with a couple of clients where... Um, extensibility is their selling point, right? They are, they, they are selling on both ends of the spectrum. They are selling to the dealers, they're selling to the suppliers, <laughs> they're selling to, to everybody. And, and so the, the, the currency is not what it used to be. Back in the day, the currency used to be the individual sale to a dealership. Yeah. Um, for, for the software industry now, the currency is data. So wherever they can get data points, that is sellable, any kind of data point. So you look at a system that integrates with Facebook and um, all of a sudden that that integration into Facebook is a selling point. Okay, Um, yeah, definitely, yeah. (laughs) You integrate into, um, you know, some kind of of financial system. Um, And when you go to the financial system to, to, you know, basically have that conversation with them, you can negotiate rates just based on the volume of customers that you have behind your software product that you're approaching the institution with. Yeah, the average car comes with at least 30 different computers now, yeah. right? And we're going towards plug and play. You, you plug your diagnostic system in, something is wrong, you download the software. Uh, that's just basically it. Yeah, what happens if the computer doesn't respond properly to that diagnostic? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Then you're going to need, you know, critical thinking it comes into play right there. Right, right, right. That, that's one of the things I think um, will always necessitate the knowledge worker. So back in the day, you were talking about the, the, the need to memorize that book and that manual. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the IT guys might be pushing to make it easier and, you know, more, more, you know, fluid. Hmm. But I think you're always going to need a knowledge worker in some way, shape, or form, regardless of what you know you try to bake into uh, you know systems to make them more viable to be diagnosed and and and, and fixed. You yeah. still need somebody who understands how the big picture is. Okay, but um, based on your experience, will you be able to compare the many DMS systems that you've seen out there to see like? Not that I wanted to say this one is better or better than the other one, but you know, just to just to give a comparison of what they have done so far and how they have helped the um, the end user. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, you you have standard um, organizations who you know will do that review for you. Companies like Catera and and Gartner. That's that's what they do. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, you you look into the the industry and you. You analyze the feature sets as well as the ease of use and the, the the functionality, the raw functionality and the support, and you come up with a overall score. And yeah. You compare those scores, um, and th- that comparison as it's progressed through the 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 years has meant the demise of certain companies that weren't able to adapt and evolve. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, you have you have DBS in the early years that because it was so focused on um, a, a server-side architecture, when the pivot came to having um, like compute powers at the end user um, platform, they weren't able to adapt. So <laughs> as I said, dealer man went the way of the world. <laughs> so, so you end up with systems like like Fraser and SAP and ADP that were able to, you know, provide that additional feature functionality, that ad- additional robustness um, in terms of expanding out of just order processing parts and give you stuff like the HR component, login capabilities, um, reporting capabilities that were a little bit more malleable. Um, currently, what's happening now is that if you are not able to extend your functionality into the web space, which everybody expects you to do, you're going to run into difficulties. So um, platforms like you know, Dealer Tracker and Dealer Center and 
and um, ABCOA, they all have embraced that and they are looking for um, pushing to that web 2.0 paradigm. Mm -hmm. What happens after this is you must now use the same kinds of IT paradigms that exist now that we, we, we spoke about before and bake those into your existing systems to expand the reach and the viability of those systems because that impacts on the, the ability of the, the dealer to occupy spaces that the end user's expectation is that you will occupy that space. They want to be able to hop on their mobile device you know, check, you know, information relating to availability, um, whether or not, you know, product review, be able to socially integrate. Those are things that they're kind of like, I need this. Yeah. So the, yeah. the next round of software that we are looking to get from the platforms has to be able to cater to that need of, you know, social viability as well as you know, the, check the original or the regular boxes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it, I think it's already here. So well, some aspect of it, because mm -hmm. I went to a, a local garage um, in my community. And when I checked the vehicle in, they were able to send me, well, the system was able to send me that the technician is now working on my vehicle. And then you yeah. could see pictures of the various areas that he checked, you see the engine, you see the body and the, the various check marks, fluid, brakes, you know, the works. And then you get a detailed report of everything that he has checked so far and then tell me when. And, and then you get another text outlining what was done, what is, what is expected, the next mile, the next maintenance uh, and the price and everything. And after all that, then you get your invoice, <laughs> right? And then you get a, a phone call from the... Um, from the service advisor so we i think we're already there but you know uh, a lot of people still don't understand the, the the what it takes to get from where we were to where we are now exactly yeah yeah, yeah. um programmatically speaking though uh, there is a lot more in store i mean you, you hear about stuff like deep fakes and and all of that stuff but people don't realize that that pivots into real world applications above and beyond the nefarious. So you might find that your contact point, which you should, used to be a person you know, yeah. telling you X, Y, Z, might be the next time around an automated service advisory. Mm -hmm. um, it might be something like um, a text message to be a timely reminder to bring back in. Yeah, I've been, I've been getting that a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we're, we're already there, yeah. Yeah, you're going to see additional stuff, you know, rolling into the 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 the, the service offering of these platforms based on utilization, based on observed flows, based on best practices that not only individuals would have um, determined, but you know, artificial intelligence will look at the the pre-existing workflows and see which would be the optimized response and optimize for that mm -hmm. so um i expect the levels of integration and scalability to just keep on you know marching along that and marching along yeah just like the industry itself it's it's not waiting no <laughs> any at all and um i saw a report just to add this one final one final observation was watching the news the other day and they had so many it, I, th I think this was in california and they had so many self-driving automotive car, automation cars on the road blocking traffic and all of that. I, I, they said one person said she counted at least 20 on our street just going round and round and round. Yeah. So that is basically where the technology is heading right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I remember watching a, 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 an interview with Elon Musk on where he saw um, the industry going um, and I think we, we hold fast to the belief that you know transportation is going to be this personal thing uh, that each individual is going to buy their own car service their own car whatever um, but he, he was mentioning something that I thought in the past five years has become more true than than before our expectations for things like 
you know, car share, car ride services has increased tremendously. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And what, what we've actually become very comfortable with is transportation as a service that you pay on either a lease system or, you know, a payment plan like, a, like almost the way Uber does it. Um, now, if you extend the concept of autonomous you know, travel onto that same you know, comfort level, it's almost like you, you don't need to own your own car. You might end up just paying into a membership platform that provides transportation from point A to point B. You know? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that. I think some of the, um, the luxury brands have, have started it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see what that actually means at the end of the day, because if it becomes a commodity that you actually just subscribe to, you know, what, what does that mean for how the industry pivots to support that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the sky is the limit where the industry is, is at. And we are, we, we, it, it will, one, one old adage would say to us, it's a, it's a good time to be alive, <laughs> to, witness <laughs> all of the, to witness all of these things. But at the same time, now we have to try to find some way how to survive um, in, this, in these trying times. But mm-hmm. uh, the fittest will always survive. That's, that's, that's how I see it. But mm-hmm. Fillmore, I, I want to thank you very much for, you know, taking this um, opportunity to explain the, the transition of how the, the technology has assisted the dealerships right throughout and uh, where we were, where we are now. And at the same time, now I know that um, more improved things are coming to assist um, the, the industry itself. Mind you, it has made us lazy, but at the <laughs> same time, yeah, it has made us, yeah, I, I can say that. It has made us lazy based on where we were, where we are now. But mm-hmm. uh, I think um, the be- the, still the best is yet to come. Can't wait to see what that ends up being. Um, in some ways, there's a fair bit of trepidation on my part too. But I, 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 I believe in the, the, the positive potential of the human condition. I, I think we are going to end up somewhere better. Um, and you have to actually believe that because otherwise... <laughs> you end up with this unhealthy fear of the future. So I'm, 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 I'm hopeful and I'm, I'm positive that um, we'll be able to positively impact on how the industry progresses forward. Oh, definitely so. Definitely so. On that note, I will end tonight's broadcast, but we will, we will definitely catch up again so we can um, continue this conversation to go deeper into the, the usability in terms of each position within the dealership itself, the diff- all the various departments um, uses the technology, how they interact with each other and the interface that is needed for, you know, to, to enhance the, the innovativeness of the, the industry itself. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. Remember to rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with a better understanding of the individuals who work in the auto industry. Remember the videos of these interviews are posted on my YouTube channel Parts Manager Professional. Until next time, this is Parts Talk.